I'm so pleased that you've joined us. And I'm especially pleased because this networking luncheon was my brainchild. It was something new. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> something new that I added to the foundations conference after I became president. Because I'm old enough to have attended the ALC back in the day when it was over at the Washington Hilton. And we would get a chance to see everybody and we would spend some time networking. And I said that this conference has gotten so big until you really don't get a chance to meet some of the people who are here. And so I wanted to have a luncheon where we could bring people together and hopefully that people wouldn't just sit at the table uh, with the people they came here with. They would meet some new people. And so that was, that was how we came about with this idea. And I'm very pleased that this year one of my board members, one of my favorite people, one of my role models, has agreed to be our speaker today, Ingrid Saunders Jones. You all can clap. I'm also very pleased that when we started looking for partners or a partner to help us with this luncheon, that we found a great partner in the Society for Human Resource Management. This is your, what, third year sponsoring? Third year sponsoring this event. They are, uh, the first year they were so pleased so they decided to keep coming back. And now, like Ms. Ingrid Saunders Jones has put her stamp on the prayer breakfast, they have put their stamp on this networking luncheon. <laughs> so I know you're going to learn a lot. I know you're going to meet people. You're going to meet people who you will keep in touch with after you leave this conference. And I have to run on to my next assignment. But before I go, I would like to introduce Pamela Green. And Pamela Green is the Chief Membership Officer for Shoreham. And she will bring you a welcome on behalf of the Society for Human Resource Management. We are so pleased to have her. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Well, good. It's so good to see all of you and to have you out again for a great event, a great networking event. We have a lot for you to do today, but I've got to follow this script that I have in front of me so that we stay on time. Uh, for, first of all, I'd like to welcome you again to the 2009 Annual Legislative Conference of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. I am Pam Green, SHRM's Chief Membership Officer, and SHRM, the Society for Human Resource Management, is the world's largest Human Resource Association. Before I begin, I would be remiss if I didn't introduce you to some very, very important people that I brought with me today. First, I'd like to introduce you to our President and CEO, Lon O'Neill, and board member, Steve Jarrett. Steve is the Senior Vice President, Human Resources for the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, FINRA. Would you please stand and greet our audience? I would also be remiss if I didn't introduce my, um, my personal mentor and, and coach, Mr. Nat Austin with AAA HR. Nat, please stand and take a bow. <laughs> On behalf of SHRM, I want to tell you how privileged we are to partner with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation once again this year to sponsor this year's networking event and luncheon. As Chief Membership Officer, I'm somewhat familiar with networking as I manage relationships with our 250,000 members across the United States and in 130 countries. This year's event could not have come at a more critical moment in our country. With our economy struggling and high unemployment rates, networking is so important, not only to help us advance our own current careers, but to also help those of us who are transitioning to new opportunities. As we know, Congress and the administration are facing unprecedented challenges, including health care, the economy, and the environment, just to name a few. Business and labor leaders, nonprofit organizations, and elected officials will all be called upon to offer expertise and solutions to our nation's challenges. 
Human resource professionals are ready to do just that. Many times, human resource professionals are on the forefront of issues that are most critical to our country. HR professionals play a crucial role in designing and administering health care benefits, finding new and innovative ways to train America's workforce, and helping to ensure diversity in the workforce. What better time for us to be communicating our strengths and what better time for all of us to be networking. Networking and human resources have always been intertwined. They, they are both about finding people who support you, who understand you, who empathize with you, guide you, encourage your growth, collaborate with you, are honest with you, and watch your back. Networking and human resources are both about building relationships that are at the core of your success. They both help people grow into their greatness and to fulfill their potential. A network helps you get out there and be heard. So don't assume that a down economy means a time to limit your expectations. On the contrary, now's the time to become more active and to make some noise. A network helps you to be confident in what you bring to the table. Now, even though this is an exceptionally good-looking audience, they didn't have to write that for me to, to say it, I know that you're very talented, and this is the point to have confidence in your abilities and to bring that confidence to your networking. To help you with your networking activities, I invite you to enjoy the member-only resources on the SHRM website as our guest until the end of October. You should, <laughs> you should have noticed at your place setting today two items. You should have uh, received uh, the SHRM magazine, the September issue, turn to page 117 to see my beautiful little face. And then, uh, and then only my mother could appreciate that. And then uh, you also are going to, you should have a letter on your, at your place setting that tells you how to take advantage of this free offer to, to take advantage of the benefits that we offer our human resource professionals. How many of you are already members of the Society for Human Resource Management? Let's see your hands. Well, thank you so much for your membership and your support of our organizations. If you are not a member of SHRM or if someone in your office is in human resources and you're not the human resource professional, I would encourage you to take this information back and have them take advantage of this offer for the next more than 30 days to get to, to get acquainted with the Society for Human Resource Management and the uh, resources and benefits that we offer our members. Now, before we hear from our speaker, speaker Ingrid Saunders-Jones, I invite all of you to take a few moments to brush up on your networking skills. I'm going to go to the next page. On the screen, bring him up. Okay. Before we do that, I want to take a few moments to bring up Congressman Meeks. I think he has a few words that he'd like to share with us, so please join me in welcoming him with a warm round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I'm glad to be here at the networking lunch. and. I wanted to come by and just tell you that this is one of the, the, the real diamonds um, that come out of the annual legislative conference for us to be able um, to come together and sharpen our tools um, to learn how to network and take something from this conference, go back to where you came from and apply it. I wanted to let you know that you're in not only for a special treat in having Ingrid Saunders-Jones um, speak to you today because she's one of the corporate leaders in the world and especially as it relates to foundations, um, has one of the greatest foundations on the face of the earth and has traveled all over the world um, to put smiles on faces and to challenge others and to bring people together for the common good. She's an outstanding member of our board and she has her and the Coca-Cola family um, have made dreams come true on behalf of so many young people, so many people that are trying to find their way, um, make a way out of no way. And I just want to uh, let you know that uh, you are truly um, getting something um, today that a lot of people wish they could get. 
Uh, here at the foundation, um, we want to make sure that we continue to provide the opportunities uh, for you to make it to the next level. And when you make it to the next level, you're going to help someone else make it to the next level. Um, the people that I talk to in the Capitol as a member of the Ways and Means Committee, um, they all made it to where they are right now through networking. I um, had an um, opportunity to talk to a gentleman that um, attend this conference, has been attending this conference for the last 11 years. And now he's working in the area of defense with, um, with the Department of Defense. And he's also working with Homeland Security back in his state because he was able to get a security clearance as a, a veteran and he was able to apply that. And he said the reason why he continues to come back to the annual legislative conference, even prior to this network luncheon, luncheon, is that he's able to meet people and he met the right people at this conference to get his business off the ground and to provide jobs for some 40 plus people. And he just came and picked up a, a uh, what you may call a, a, um, a conference bag and started stepping, in to, stepping into brain trust and he started meeting this person and that person and then five years after that he was talking on the panel and now he has 40 employees um, because he came here to interface with those um, that are doing something similar and he was able to build those relationships and, and, and make things happen. So I'm going to uh, let the networking begin and I know that Ms. Saunders Jones is going to be um, introduced and brought up and I'm going to, as chairman, I'm going to run downstairs and, and, and go to a, another uh, brain trust, but I want to let you know that you're definitely in for a treat. Thank you for being a part of this. I want you to come back year after year so that we can continue to make our community strong and make America strong. Thank you. Well, we're really excited that you've had a chance to network. I believe that you were able to make some very long-lasting, uh, establish some very long-lasting relationships. So we look forward to you connecting further. Now I want to get on to the most important part of our program, and that is to hear from our distinguished speaker, Ingrid Saunders-Jones. She's asked me to condense her, um, her bio just a little bit, but I'll tell you just after um, having met her, she is such a warm and wonderful uh, woman. She's not just a distinguished speaker, but she truly is a power broker, and I'm really excited to be able to uh, introduce her to you today, give you all a chance to, to get a little settled. So our keynote speaker really is no stranger to networking. Ingrid Saunders-Jones leads the Coca-Cola Company's Global Community Engagement Function, Global Community Connections. Under Ms. Jones' leadership, Global Community Connections works to make a unique and sustainable difference everywhere the Coca-Cola company sells products, one community at a time, by focusing on four global priority areas, water, stewardship, fitness and active lifestyles, sustainable packaging, and education. As chair of the Coca-Cola Foundation, Ms. Jones leads the company's philanthropic commitment to sustainable communities. Under her leadership, the Coca-Cola Foundation has contributed more than $256 million to education and other community initiatives. Early in her career, Ms. Jones spent three years as executive assistant to the Honorable Maynard Jackson, then mayor of Atlanta, and two years as legislative analyst for the president of the Atlantic, Atlanta I'm sorry, City Council, Mr. Carl Ware. She is a former executive director of the Detroit Wayne County Child Care Coordinating Council and taught in the public schools of Detroit and Atlanta. Recognition of her work and contributions include Essence Magazine selection as one of 11 National Women of Influence, the National Urban League's uh, Women of Power Award, and 365 Black Awards sponsored by the McDonald's Corporations. Please join me in welcoming to the stage a truly successful trailblazer, Ms. Ingrid Saunders-Jones. Well, thank you very much, Pam, for that um, introduction. And um, I'm going to be real honest with you. This is a hard room to give a speech in. So I'm going to um, ask for your help because 
I feel very far away, the way the stage, I'm going to talk to Elsie Scott about this, okay? I feel very far away the way the stage is set up. So you may feel far away too, but I'm aware of every mo movement, every conversation in this room. So I'm going to do my part and I'm going to ask you to help me as the audience as we move through this. And what I can guarantee you is that next year we're going to have a more network friendly setup. Now how about that? But let me begin by bringing greetings to you from Mutar Kent, the chairman and CEO of the Coca-Cola Company. I have some Coca-Cola colleagues with me today. I'm going to ask them to stand. Wanda Rodwell, who's communications director for Global Community Connections, and Roger Johnson, who um, is the director of community partnerships for Coca-Cola North America. And, and, and before I get started, I want to brag on Coca-Cola just a minute. My friend Cecilia kind of reminded me of this because I do want to brag on Wanda and Ro Roger and uh, some other colleagues of mine who are not here about um, a $7 million gift that we gave to the Atlanta University Center just 10 days ago. Yeah. And um, those that, that $7 million was spread percentage by enrollment um, to uh, um, Clark Atlanta University, Morehouse College, Morehouse School of Medicine, Spelman College, and then we did a million dollar, uh, a $1.2 million grant to the Atlanta University Center Library to assist with their technology infrastructure because indeed that library houses the King Papers that are owned by Morehouse. So I want to just say um, thank you for letting me brag. <laughs> and thank you, Wanda and Roger. Um, Dr. Elsie Scott, when she calls, I answer, and so I was very um, honored when she called and asked me to be the speaker today. Um, you always wonder when you're preparing for a speech what you can say that's different. So I thought hard, uh, long and hard about that because this is a subject that's been around since business cards and guys getting get together to play a round of golf. Now I have a lot of things I could have said. I could have gone to the very definition of networking as provided by Webster's or I could have uh, gone in a lot of different directions. But I'm, I've, what I've picked, I'm going to acknowledge, is very narrow, uh, but I hope it will be f helpful. Now, th one of the first things that came to mind is a, a speech about the impact of the social media phenomenon. Tw Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and all the other ubiqu ubiquitous uh, social meeting tools, the Blackberry, the iPhone, the Palm Pre, emails, instant messaging, that, that all of those things that keep us connected 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They indeed, in my mind, are a blessing and a curse at the same time. The good news is we operate in real time. The bad news is we can become a slave to real time, all of which real time, all of which real time is not useful. And it serves to disconnect us from having real relationships with real people. But I didn't pick that as the topic today. <laughs> but I want to give it to you as something to think about, and, uh, and that's a speech for another day. Um, well, I would say this, though. When you're reading a tweet and only do emails, people really don't get the full flavor of you. They don't know how hard you work. They don't know how quick and high your intelligence is. They don't know about your personal courage. They don't know about how thoughtful you are as a leader. They don't know how you build personal relationships. And in my mind, those really are the basic things that go with networking. 
So again, that's not the topic I picked. We'll talk about that another time. So I want to start by um, sharing with you that I really do look for wisdom from where, uh, 24 hours a day, wherever it comes from. And a piece of wisdom that I found in a book written by Andrew Young, the former ambassador, the former mayor of Atlanta, former congressman, was what it was something that I found to be powerfully instructive. He wrote a book called A Way Out of No Way. And in it, Andy Young talks about success. And networking really is a conversation about success. What helps us become successful? So I want to share that quote with you. And Andrew Young said, my life has unfolded around me in ways that fill me with awe and wonder. I am not alone or special in this experience of success. Most of the successful men and women I have known can point to moments of destiny in their lives, times when a simple decision produced complex and meaningful results which were totally beyond anticipation. These simple decisions, Andy goes on to say, lead to the multiple coincidences in one's life. And it is the interrelationship of multiple coincidences of one's life that makes many of us believe and know that there is a divine purpose and power in human life. And I will say to you, I know that my life, indeed, has unfolded around me in ways that have astounded me. And in each instance, there was a person who made the difference. So each of us, during our life's journey, will experience times when one simple action makes the difference an action that ties in to our potential and changes our, the, all the possibilities for us. And that is fundamentally what networking is about from my perspective. The times when a purposeful, simple decision by someone else produces complex and meaningful results which often result in the moments of destiny in our lives. So when Elsie invited me to speak today, I said, well, what should I speak about? And she said, tell your story. Well, with that as the backdrop, I'm not sure how interesting you're going to find the story, but I'm going to tell you my story because it's the story absolutely that I know best. Now, I'm not going to tell everything because <laughs> i got people here to keep me honest. I've got people from Detroit, where I grew up. I've got people, my best friend from Atlanta, she knows what the real deal is. <laughs> and I've got people who went to college with me, Ms. Atterbury. So I'm going to give you the highlights. But what you need to know is I always kept going forward. Because 27 years ago, I never would have imagined that one day I would be a senior executive at the Coca-Cola company. But with hard work, and I do work hard, and more than a little help, and I have had a lot of help, here I stand before you today. The first thing I want to tell you is that my family, especially my parents, have been the single greatest influence in my life. My father was born in Knoxville, Tennessee and attended Knoxville College and went to graduate school at the University of Michigan. My mother was born in Tryon, North Carolina, graduated from Knoxville College also and went on to graduate school and got her master's from Wayne State University. I am a proud product of the Detroit public schools and have a passion for the support of the public school systems. 
I went on to get a degree, an undergraduate degree from Michigan State Uni uh, University. And after a couple of years of teaching, because I am an education person by training, I went back to school and got my master's at Eastern Michigan uh, University. From this point on, all of my jobs came to my attention through a friend, someone else's thoughtful and purposeful outreach to me. When I finished graduate school, because I was one of those folks who moved back to my parents' home to finish graduate school, um, I was broke and I needed a job and they were not hiring teachers. In fact, um, at that point, I had a very clear vision for my professional path in life. I got my master's degree, check. I was going to continue teaching. I would become a principal. And after that, I would become a superintendent. And I would ultimately end up as a professor of education. So those were my plans. And then life happened. Life happened, they weren't hiring teachers in Detroit. But because I had a college friend working for the Burger King Corporation uh, who gave me a call and a tip, I went to work for a man named Brady Keys. And Brady Keys was the first African American owner of a, a multiple uh, fast food franchises, and all of his franchises were in urban areas. They were in Pittsburgh, New York, um, Detroit, and Cleveland. So it was my first foray into business, into traveling for business. So I learned a lot from um, this job, and it kind of served as an operational platform for jobs going forward. I did, however, want to get back into the world of education, and after a while, I got a call from Pat Horn, you all know her, um, at that table. And she called me to say, oh, by the way, there is a position at a nonprofit uh, child care advocacy uh, group in Detroit. And I decided that I would apply for that position. So I got my little Corona typewriter out, and I typed up my resume, and I called down there, and I made an appointment with the, the um, executive director's secretary. And I said, I'm going to bring my resume tomorrow. Well, because I was going to see Ms. Jackson instead of the executive director, Ms. Brown, <clears throat> I went out in um, wedged knee-high boots with my, my uh, blue jeans tucked in and with a leather jacket that matched my boot and I had two afro puffs and I just went on down to the Merrill Palmer Institute and knocked on the door. So there I stood, ready. Well, Miss Jackson was sick that day and Miss Brown answered the door. And everything that I was, Miss Brown wasn't. Everything that Miss Brown was, I wasn't. <laughs> that was a lesson, okay? Be prepared wherever you go. <laughs> and Sally Brown knew at the time that she was looking for a successor. I thought I was just getting a job. So we worked through the differences in our appearance and presentation. She took my resume and she said, she noticed the street I lived on and she said, oh, do you know the Showalters? And I said, oh, I went to school with, uh, elementary school with Ann Showalter. And I'm sure that led to a whole lot of other checking. But I did what I didn't know about Ann's father was that he was the president of the UAW and that Sally's husband worked for him. So I don't even know what happened in that networking, but I do know that something happened. And the next thing I know, I had a job. Again, I thought I had a job. She was looking for her successor. That job helped me broaden my resume with organizational nonprofit management experience. We had, a board of, we had a board of directors, we had staff, we had funding. We had funding from three multiple sources. I wrote proposals, I did the correspondence. I was the program specialist 
that Sally relied on to help administer the organization. And that job indeed was the jump off point for another call that I got from a, a buddy from Detroit. His name is Robert Carson, but if I say that, that name in Detroit, nobody would know him. They know him by Coot. You know, everybody got Junebug and Coot, somebody like that. But he was, we had gone to graduate school together and he called me and told me about a fellowship in the city of Atlanta, the Atlanta Fellows Program, patterned after the White House Fellows Program, where you're actually assigned to government. So I took my little Corona typewriter out, filled out the application, wrote an essay, and you know, we really weren't doing overnight stuff back then. Uh, got it in, got it postmarked in time, and then waited. Well, I actually got called to Atlanta to come uh, to go down for an interview. And when I got there, the first thing we did was the dinner. And they were going to select four fellows, and there were 12 people who had been selected from all over the country to interview for those four slots. Everybody had a PhD, an MBA, or they were a lawyer, and then there was me. So I just kind of relaxed. I said, now, you know, this is in my brain. I said, this is never going to happen. I just kind of relaxed. I went through two days of interviews with representatives from the, uh, the, the city of Atlanta, Fulton County, Central Atlanta Progress, and the Chamber of Commerce. And in those interviews, because I was relaxed, I think I was very conversational focused, had been running an agency so I could talk about community. Coot threw a party before I left, and then I went back to Detroit and kind of settled back into my life. And about three and a half weeks later, they call and said, you've been accepted. Wow. They said, can you come in two weeks? I said, no, I'm running an agency. I, I've got to have at least a month. So I joined the Atlanta Fellows in Detroit, uh, in Atlanta from Detroit, about five weeks after they joined. Now that decision was one of the defining moments in my life, one that I now can point to and recognize as something that changed the trajectory of my professional life. After the fellowship year, um, again, I was assigned to the Atlanta City Council. The City Council president, whose name was Carl, is Carl Ware, um, he was president at the time, um, asked me to come and work for, them, for him. Now, I had to make a decision because I I actually was thinking um, very hard about going back to Detroit because, you know, you have your plans and like I said, life happens. By that time, I was divorced, life was happening and I needed to kind of figure out where I was going to be. But I went to work for the city council president um, and that was a good thing. He decided he was not going to stand for elected office again. And so again, I had to decide which direction I was going to go. Was I going to go back to Wayne State University's Center for Urban Studies, or was I going to stay in Atlanta? And about that time, the mayor's chief of staff, the mayor then was Mayor Maynard Jackson, um, his chief of staff, Walter Huntley, came to me and said, Maynard Jackson would like you to come and work for him. I said, no. I said, he's too difficult. I've heard all about it. I know you all, Cecilia. <laughs> and, and again, I had my eyesight set on Detroit. That night, Walter came over my house, hadn't called, that was a no-no, hadn't called, just knocked on my door. I let him in, he said, Ingrid, I know you haven't been here long, but we don't say no to Maynard Jackson. <laughs> and you know, he went on and on, 
So he says, the mayor wants to see you tomorrow. So I said, okay. So I was in my office in the city council, and the mayor came down to my office. Now, the mayor didn't spend a lot of time in the city council office, so it was a big deal. And he said to me, Ingrid, I'm getting ready to go out of town. I'll be back tomorrow, and I'd like to meet with you. I said, fine. And so I spent that whole night figuring out how I was going to tell him no. The appointed time came. I went into the mayor's office to have the meeting, and 15 minutes later I came out, and I was going to work for Maynard Jackson. Man, that was a good decision on my part. He was an awesome, courageous, smart leader with vision and purpose. And I got to be around that every day in an office that adjoined his. Now, was it easy? No. Did we lock horns sometimes? Yes. Did I learn a lot? Absolutely. And I cherish what I learned from Maynard Jackson uh, because he mentored me in a way that was unusual for a man to mentor a woman at that time. So, Maynard Jackson's um, second term came to an end. So we're looking at, we're looking at, oh, what's Ingrid going to do now? And Carl Ware, who had been the city council president, was now a vice president at the Coca-Cola Company, and he asked me if I would consider coming to work for him. Now the problem was, I was going to have to take a pay cut from government. And the problem was, I was going to have to go in as an administrative assistant. Now I'd run an agency, executive assistant to the mayor, taught, got a master's. So I had to think about that. I asked Maynard Jackson and my father, and both of them said the same thing in different words, and I'm going to share what Maynard said. He said, if you're going to go to work for a company, there's no better company in the world to work for than the Coca-Cola company. Now, there were no women in management that I could go ask what their experience had been. But I decided that at that point in my life, I could take that risk. I could um, take all my learnings and go to the Coca-Cola company and work for someone that I trusted. And I did. And. Um, Almost 26 years later, I see the importance of being willing, really, to take risks when opportunities present themselves through other people. Now, when I joined the Coca-Cola Company, I was fortunate um, enough to uh, come to the attention of Roberto Goizueta, our former chairman and CEO. He too was a, um, uh, an extraordinary leader. Um, Mr. Goizueta, and, and he told me this before he died, he was impressed with how I worked. He was impressed that I made my boss look good. He was impressed that I spoke without fear and that I wrote crisp memos. I remember it very well. So my boss and I agreed that Roberto Goizueta was a great leader and um, he was, his penchant for details was led, were, um, it, really he always said God is in the details and that was kind of my, my role model. He said, and I pass this on because it might be meaningful to someone, um, to be successful you have to have intelligence which goes beyond beyond book learning and degrees, you have to be decisive because, and the, being decisive takes intellectual courage, and you have to be loyal, loyal t to yourself first, your values, and your own code of honor. Um, 
I want to tell you a short story about him because when my boss got a promotion and I got his job, Carl Ware's job, um, Roberto called me up one day and said, I'd like you to meet me at the Commerce Club at 7.30 uh, next Tuesday. And I said, okay, I'll be there. And he was taking me to a meeting of the action forum. Well, there had never been a woman in the action forum, but that never occurred to Roberto, because if my boss went and now I have my boss's job, then I should go. So here we go into the action forum that Tuesday morning. Well, you know, everybody was just like, but you don't, you don't say anything to the chairman of the Coca-Cola Company in Atlanta, Georgia. So boy, was the buzz on. So later that afternoon, Roberto called me to his office. And he said, now I'm not going to tell you who called me, but I've gotten several calls about my taking a woman to the action form. And he said, Ingrid, Carl went because he had that job. Now you have the job. And he said, and I told them, guess what? She's black too. <laughs> <laughs> and so I tell you those stories to point out then it, it is uh, during each step along each each step along my career path. Um, I've used it as an opportunity to watch and learn from others, uh, to continually push the edges of my own comfort zone because I did find myself in places that were unfamiliar. And when you find yourself in places unfamiliar, you're often outside of your own comfort zone. Um, so as I close, I have one final thought and then one final story. And the thought is simply this, and it is kind of tangential to this flow, but I, 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 uh, it comes from a book that I've read. And, that, and it comes to you in the form of the question, and it says, it, the book is um, Brand You. So I ask you, what does your brand stand for? If you've never thought of yourself as a brand, I think you should. And we talk about brand attributes. What do people think about you? What do, what about, and, and what do they think about your work? You know, um, do they find you pleasant? Because unpleasant people don't go far. Do you work hard? Because people who don't work hard don't go far. Are you fair? Are you trustworthy? Can you be counted on? What are the attributes that pop off of you? Because just like the best known brands in the business world, your brand stands for something in the minds of your colleagues and your friends and the people you meet. So I ask you to ask yourself, what is it that makes you different? What is it that makes people want to help you get to where you want to go? What is it that would motivate a person to provide an access point for you? Because that's what my story is about, the access points that I found along the way. So that's my final thought. That's a whole speech in and of itself, too. But you're only going to get that much today.